FitLife Brands gave more than 25 million reasons why it believes in the muscle farm turnaround. So why am I not impressed? I'll decode that introductory question a bit later in this content, but on March 29th of 2024, FitLife Brands updated the public markets by releasing its 2023 fourth quarter and full year earnings report. I'll be utilizing that financial information along with the notes I took while listening to the earnings conference call, and then also any relevant publicly disclosed information to obviously update you on the recent performance of the FitLife Brands portfolio, but also utilize everything to provide further context for my expanded strategic commentary on trends that are happening within the nutritional supplement space. For those new to my content that might not be too familiar, the supplement brands that are within the FitLife brands portfolio are now categorized in four segments. NDS products, which are a collection of brands mostly sold in the GNC franchise system. Isatory products, which are a collection of brands sold through a diversified retail mix. Mimi's Rock Corporation products, which are a collection of brands mostly sold on Amazon and then Muscle Farm, which was acquired on October 10th of 2023. In total, the FitLife Brands portfolio is sold through, I think, more than 20,000 retail locations globally. But let's dive into a quick financial breakdown, starting with the company's performance in the fourth quarter. FitLife Brands had quarterly revenue of $13.3 million, which was up 148% year over year. Now, on face value, that obviously looks impressive, but you had both the Mimi's Rock and Muscle Farm acquisitions that happened in 2023 and greatly impacted the comparable growth percentage. If you look at the revenue from a quarter over quarter sequential basis, FitLife Brands revenue declined around 4.3%. And that decline seems to be coming from the Mimi's Rock segment as FitLife Brands reduced year over year advertising by almost half, which resulted in around a 12% less revenue in the fourth quarter. But if we strip out the Mimi's Rock contribution, the legacy FitLife Brands quarterly revenue was up 14% year over year. This was driven by an 18% increase in wholesale revenue and a 9% increase in online revenue. And since this was the year-end report, let's recap how FitLife Brands performed throughout 2023. The supplement brand portfolio reported total revenues of $52.7 million, which was an increase of 83% year over year. As noted earlier, this comparative is skewed because of acquisitions, but FitLife Brands did provide a pro forma report that shows total revenue would have been down 1.2% year over year if those acquisitions had occurred on January 1st of 2022. Next. I want to talk about the sales channel mix because that's been a major focus of the company's leadership over the last five years. Historically speaking, aka legacy FitLife brands, these supplement brands generated most of their revenue from the retailer GNC. And by most, I mean close to 80% at one point, which that key customer risk has become even more problematic with the constant business troubles of that specialty retailer over the last five to seven years. In fact, during the earnings call, the CEO stated something sort of funny regarding the importance of GNC, mentioning that foot traffic struggle as bad news, but them not losing share as good news, which is like saying the Titanic is sinking, but it's okay because we guarded our life vest. But now consider that throughout 2023, GNC at least only made up 62% of the total legacy FitLife brands revenue. The diversification of the legacy FitLife brand segment has come from more focus being placed on e-commerce with that channel now accounting for $9.3 million in 2023 revenue. And that might sound super small to you, but consider the fact that in 2018, legacy FitLife brands only sold $850,000 worth of supplements online. Additionally, consider the legacy FitLife brands don't want to step on GNC franchisees playbook that avoids channel conflict by pricing products higher on Amazon. And that process is more impressive. But with 
the Amazon focused Mimi's Rock segment added into the mix, FitLife brands would now actually be considered a digital first supplement brand portfolio because about 63% of the total revenue in 2023 came from e-commerce. So they've been on quite a business transformation journey as of late. But maybe that's a good transition into talking about the most intriguing segment within FitLife Brands. As mentioned earlier, FitLife Brands officially closed the $18.5 million acquisition of the bankrupt Muscle Farm asset on October 10th of 2023. But even though Muscle Farm was owned for the vast majority of Q4, its contribution to the FitLife Brands quarterly performance was immaterial because they needed to procure inventory as basically no inventory was acquired in the asset purchase and they needed to negotiate new retail agreements with Muscle Farm's existing wholesale customers. According to FitLife Brands leadership, some of that process took a couple of weeks, but others took the entire quarter. As an example, one that did take much longer would be on the Amazon Marketplace, where Muscle Farm previously utilized an exclusive third-party seller agreement FitLife Brands took that channel ownership in-house and hasn't sold any product to that reseller, but has allowed them to sell through their inventory without price competition. FitLife Brands estimates that it's now the primary Amazon seller of Muscle Farm for approximately 95% of the product portfolio. So what that all means is that Muscle Farm's business really didn't begin ramping up in terms of both wholesale and online sales until this current first quarter of 2023. Because of that, FitLife Brands gave some additional forward-looking statements based on preliminary first quarter numbers to show the early turnaround progress at Muscle Farm. Sticking with the online side of revenues first, FitLife Brands has indicated that Muscle Farm generated an estimated just over $1 million. The Amazon business is scaling nicely, and I think their floor of doing about $5 million annually on that marketplace is extremely conservative. On the wholesale side of Muscle Farm, it looks like FitLife Brands is utilizing an old sales playbook in hopes that it still has some juice left to squeeze from it. What I mean by that is that it's establishing or kind of reestablishing good relationships with previous key customers at Muscle Farm from several years ago. Those would be iHerb, that's a US-based e-commerce retailer that sells mostly to international customers, and Copang, that's basically the South Korean version of Amazon. Beyond that, FitLife Brands has and will continue having discussions with several other wholesale partners that previously sold Muscle Farms products. The elephant in the room wholesale partner, Costco, is likely a huge long shot in the near term to the point that I wouldn't even spend time or resources on it right now. In the world of wholesale clubs with very low categorical selection already, when you kind of burn somebody like Costco, you must prove that you've changed and that takes uh, quite a long time actually. And that's an important idea to expand on because it isn't a Costco only challenge to overcome within the wholesale channel. While FitLife Brands is a completely new owner of Muscle Farm that had nothing to do with its past, there are still retail buyers that got burned by previous ownership or leadership some of those retail buyers might even want to be made whole before they even talk about future partnerships with FitLife brands in terms of Muscle Farm. So that process of rebuilding the Muscle Farm business reputation and brand on retail shelves is going to take time. This is especially true considering that FitLife brands doesn't want to utilize major promotional spend to jumpstart Muscle Farm selling interest or sell through just yet until they get a strategic baseline on top and bottom line. That makes predicting wholesale revenue a bit tougher, but my guess is that in Q1 will be somewhere around one and one quarter million dollars, making the total quarterly revenue at Muscle Farm around $2.25 million. That's a slight drop in revenue year over year from the 2023 bankrupt Muscle Farm era, and even a more significant drop from the $3.8 million in Q3 revenue the company generated before the FitLife brand's acquisition. So then what is needed for FitLife brands to turn around Muscle Farm? And maybe I should start by giving my definition or maybe easier how I don't define a Muscle Farm turnaround. What it doesn't look like is the Muscle Farm that I left more than a dozen years ago because 
That has really deteriorated significantly since those golden years when I was a part of the sports nutrition brand's hyper growth phase. In fact, the chance of getting back to the heyday of Muscle Farm, both from an influence or impact and revenue perspective is quite honestly a statistical anomaly. But even clawing back to that level of the last few years pre-bankruptcy will be extremely tough. That being said, FitLife Brands isn't looking to hit a home run with the Muscle Farm turnaround, or so I thought before I heard the comments on the earnings call and them sharing a new element of the strategic game plan. I started off this section by saying Muscle Farm is the most intriguing segment within FitLife Brands. Because firstly, and I'm sorry to be this blunt, but the rest of the portfolio is boring. And then secondly, I've documented for the last five or seven years that I thought there's a large amount of unlocked value within the Muscle Farm brand from mismanagement. But I'm fearing that FitLife brands might be getting excited about early indicators of sales performance, getting overly confident, and might be getting caught up in the last and biggest part of that old Muscle Farm sales playbook, launching more and more new SKUs. Even back in the early 2010s when I was working at Muscle Farm, co-founder Brad Pyatt loved to send me to our various contract manufacturers to help launch new products at a feverish pace. The good news was that back then, we were also equally obsessed with what was best for the Muscle Farm brand. But as the business struggled years later and Brad Pyatt resigned, all of that brand vision for Muscle Farm left with him. Muscle Farm began to chase off-brand product trends, totally wreck any semblance of brand standards, and basically lost all emotional connection with its customers. So what has me all up in arms? We already heard previously from FitLife Brands leadership that they would relaunch some historically successful Muscle Farm products. I stated that they needed to focus on rebuilding the Assault Energy platform and refining the Combat Protein platform. While I didn't explicitly state this, I meant in the ready-to-mix powder form factor. That's because FitLife brands are good operators with solid track records of driving sales inside specialty supplement retailers. And while they sell a legacy SKU or two in large retailers, they are not proficient in those sales channels. So if they move into ready-to-eat or God forbid ready-to-drink form factors again anytime soon, they would need to significantly retool their sales leadership and organizational structure to make a categorical impact. And I'm sure you know where I'm going with this because FitLife Brands announced they are bringing back the Muscle Farm Combat Crunch Protein Bar in three flavors and initially sold online starting in a few weeks. Don't get it twisted though, I would relaunch the Combat Crunch Bars as well if I was running the show but just not after essentially only being fully operational with Muscle Farm for three months. I would be 100% focusing for the next probably 12 or 18 months on blocking and tackling because there shouldn't be any rush here considering financial variables that I'll cover here next. So that strategic game plan would be focused on energy and protein powders that are sold mostly on Amazon and online, but within select specialty retailers and, and maybe even a few of the easier international markets. And then the rest of the segment resources would be spent on rebuilding the brand story to end consumers and rebuilding the trust with wholesale customers. That's it. Boring, but effective when considering the need to rebuild the foundation for future growth opportunities. But it seems FitLife Brands is caught up in the idea that the Muscle Farm Combat Crunch Bars at its peak sold more than 25 million bars annually. The CEO stated on the call, it's kind of fascinating that a company with a very successful product would kill it, but it wasn't intentional. They were in financial distress and they hadn't paid some of their manufacturers, including the one that made their bars. So they just couldn't get anyone to make them. What he stated was factually true, but I think it misses some of the underlying factors that caused the skew rationalization maybe two or three years ago. Firstly, Combat Crunch Bars launched in September of 2014 and were originally made by the contract manufacturer Bakery Barn. This was about a year after the contract manufacturer created the successful Robert Irvine Fit Crunch Bar. That's an important detail because typically functional food contract manufacturers after creating a big winner will start to offer a slightly varied offering to other market leaders. 
I believe Muscle Farm was the first copycat product of this type of baked layered protein bars, but in the next handful of years, you had many competitors offering similar products. That created a competitive risk, but also saturated the market in this protein bar type, and I believe accelerated the already quick categorical product life cycle. Secondly, these bars tended to age fairly quickly and provided poor customer experience. That's important to consider when competitive risk within specialty retail spikes, and you have to move to larger retail distribution systems. Additionally on the product, since it's enrobed in a chocolate-like coating, you get melting that happens in the hot months. That requires then a more costly logistics setup to minimize that, or you risk an elevated return rate, especially from large retailers. That hurts already relatively weaker margin profiles in that category. But these combat crunch bars got hit with a double whammy of external threats in like 2020 or 2021 that further crushed its viability. These timing related external threats were that the great shutdown hurt the protein bar category because of low consumer mobility. And you also had milk protein commodity input costs spike double to triple its normal levels. So some of that is a non-factor here for FitLife brands, but some are still risks that need to be considered, especially when you look at projected margins within the muscle farm segment and how that relates to the return on investment. Muscle Farm currently has a product sales mix that's heavy on protein. During the bankrupt era of Muscle Farm last quarter, the brand had Q3 gross margins that were 32.8%. In fiscal 2023, FitLife Brands had gross margins that were just below 41%. So where does FitLife Brands make up the almost 800 basis point difference? If they follow the strategic game plan of the Mimi's Rock acquisition, FitLife Brands would massively cut inefficient advertising expenses and gain the rest from acquisition synergies. The problem is that Muscle Farm didn't have the same advertising fat to cut because it was in bankruptcy that required major scrutiny over every expense. So yes, FitLife brands will have more economies of scale and negotiation power on the supply side, which will result in an immediate positive impact to the Muscle Farm gross margins. Then going back to that Combat Crunch bar launch, these will be initially sold mostly on Amazon, which is an extremely competitive marketplace for the category and offers low margins because of the pack size weight. Any large retail planogram considerations that do help categorical margins from distribution efficiencies and potential scale of unit sales will have to come in late 2024 or early 2025 at the earliest. But Maybe this is a good transition to end with some quick final thoughts around how that impacts Muscle Farm's return on investment and FitLife Brands future capital deployment overall. As mentioned previously, FitLife Brands paid, let's just say right under $19 million for Muscle Farm when you add in the transaction expenses. Leadership said they expect to easily generate three to $4 million in EBITDA from the Muscle Farm segment, which seems high to me unless they get that revenue cranking back up towards $20 million with a good product sales mix. The good news is even if that takes FitLife brands a handful of years to return capital on that muscle farm investment, they are already generating enough free cash flow to feed overall portfolio growth and simultaneously reduce its indebtedness. Moreover, it means that after integration of these deals are at a sufficient stage, FitLife Brands will pull the trigger on additional acquisition opportunities. Here's the good news about the supplement industry that the CEO is also very aware of. It's highly fragmented with a collection of relatively good brands that have bad financials. That provides a great opportunity to consolidate the market. But I hope you enjoyed this YouTube video. If you did, consider hitting that like button to support me. Also help me get to my new short-term goal of 4,000 subscribers by hitting that subscribe button. I'd love to see you join me on this journey, but we need to fix the fact that I think just over 90% of you that are watching this YouTube video right now are not subscribed to my channel, and that makes me extremely sad. But I do want to thank you for tuning in, and I'll see you on the next one.